Good morning, CCDA. Good morning, Coach. Well, um, I uh, am the president of Mission Year and uh, the uh, president uh, or co-executive director of uh, FCS Urban Ministries in Atlanta, where Bob Lupton founded. Um, and uh, I am excited about what we're about to hear this morning. Uh, this, this panel is uh, a group of incredible leaders uh, that are working uh, in various places around the country uh, and trying to tackle this, uh, this problem of education we have. And, you know, John Perkins, Dr. Perkins this morning uh, fires us, fired us up about solving problems, you know, and, 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 and he has me fired up. I shouldn't get up after Dr. Perkins. Preachers, he just fires you up and makes you want to preach. But I need to let these, let these folks talk. Um, we do have a problem, though, uh, and education is plaguing our communities and plaguing the communities of poor children and children of color. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we have hope, and the hope is uh, in Jesus, and the hope is that there are uh, these, these, little, these this little marks of the kingdom in these places, and those little marks we know represent the leaven of the kingdom. And those little marks can, can begin to spread. And hopefully this week, you've, you've heard a little bit um, from this stage. Uh, you've uh, gone to a, just a film in the evening. Uh, you've attended a workshop. And so this now is on your radar. And today I want to I wanna, um, invite these panelists to give us some examples that we can take back with us. We got Matthew Watts here from West Virginia. Uh, Matthew is... Uh, an advocate uh, for, for education in his state, and we'll be talking about that. We have Elizabeth Frazier from Philly uh, with Esperanza, uh, and Esperanza is pretty much putting together an entire school system to deal with this in Philly. And then we got Pastor Brooks, uh, and Pastor Brooks here is representing, he's up here because, you know, pastors are getting a bad name sometimes, and so he's going to stick up for the pastors today. And, uh, and then we have Kimberly Richardson from Chicago, uh, who is going to be talking to us. She directs homeschool communities, uh, and we'll hear a little bit about that. And then we have Danny Warfel from Atlanta, uh, and uh, his organization, Desire Street, takes the approach of supporting uh, various programs that are dealing with education around the Southeast. So I'm going to let them introduce them themselves and talk a little bit about their work uh, and what they're doing in, in, each of their, in each of their states. So let's start um, with Matthew. Well, I'm also a pastor. I pastor the Grace Bible Church of Charleston, and we also operate the uh, uh, Hope Community Development Corporation. Basically, what we're trying to do is to apply the eight principles of Christian community development uh, to the educational challenges that we found, find. And so we've established a, uh, an entire community project, the West Side Revitalization and Transformation Initiative. We see education as a, one of the components of the community's revitalization. And so we've been able to work with our state government uh, to get legislation passed to establish a community development pilot demonstration project. Uh, our state does not have legislation that allow for charter schools. And so we're working within the current state structure. Uh, we've got partnerships established with the American Federation of Teachers and National Education Association uh, because they are part of our community. And so basically we're trying to apply these principles of CCDA to education in uh, concert with the housing, workforce development, job training initiative, and that type of thing, uh, to kind of create a movement uh, to lift uh, public education. And so we believe with 50 million children in America in the public school system, 80 million parents, almost a half of the uh, country's population is connected some kind of way to the public school system. Therefore, there has to be uh, some groups that remain uh, committed to the challenge of trying to transform uh, the public school system where the majority of uh, uh, poor children from low and under-resourced communities uh, will be educated. Thank you, man. I'm Elizabeth Conde Frazier, and I want to begin by saying, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Amen. After 10 years of serving the community in Philadelphia, Esperanza College of Eastern University was honored with the Hispanic Choice Award of being the Hispanic Champion of the Year. We are, you have to celebrate when the Lord does these things for you because you know the challenges. You know the challenges. 
And you know that when you innovate, no one necessarily celebrates what mm. you do mm -hmm. because you're really different and you have to be bucking the system. But after a while, if you do things with excellence, you have to be recognized. Esperanza is a um, faith-based organization. And if we could get to the next slide so you could see some of the things. We do housing. There's the refurbishing of homes and selling, um, selling those homes then at affordable prices. There's financial literacy, foreclosure counseling. All of that has educational pieces to it. There's the music program because music is taken out of the schools and we know how important that is for developing the brain of a person and for developing who we are fully in Christ. And so we have those pieces. They have partnered with the Opera House and with the Berkeley School of Music. The national programs, again, relational education, marriages of hope, mentoring, uh, women of hope, mujeres de esperanza, immigration uh, the, for the family, for reunification, and then advocacy. We are to be prophets of the Lord. Advocacy is about being in the courts of the king. And then we have the workforce pieces. We have an earn center, which is helping persons move from being on um, federal assistance to moving on to having agency in their lives. And we have a career link, which helps persons to be able to have basic skills for work and for knowing how to do resumes and so forth. And then in the area of public education, we have a charter high school and Esperanza College. And then climate is the last of the pieces that I will say more about later. Um, we are able to, if we could get to the next uh, frame very quickly, if you notice there is the faith-based organization Esperanza Inc. working with Eastern University that has a BA program. We offer an AA. Notice that on the entering side, we give people financial aid workshops so they understand what they're doing. We give them an extended orientation. You can see the concentrations that we offer there. And then we also offer supportive services, which is mentoring, tutoring, professional development, and internships. We don't offer a concentration that's not going to lead you into a job because we don't have time for all that. We need to have internships so you can have it on your resume and you can go from school to being able to have a job. And so that's important. We are a uh, Hispanic serving institution. We have that status. We are, were the first in the state of Pennsylvania to have that status. We have a graduation rate that ranges from 60 to 68 percent. If you compare that to other Hispanic serving institutions where the graduation rate is 35 percent, if you compare that to community colleges where graduation rate is about 11 percent, we're not doing too bad, but we keep working toward <laughs> excellence. Our students who go, can graduate in two years, even evening students, is about 91.8%. And then the students that will move on to do their BA degree because they transition seamlessly into Eastern University is about 85.9%. The spiritual... The curriculum does include courses that lead students to reflect on their spiritual lives, opening up opportunity for them to be exposed to the scriptures and to an invitation to Christ as Savior and to deeper discipleship by coming to an understanding of what it means to do justice in the community. Because yes, faith, reason, and justice is the logo of Eastern University. And I've, I have a student, I want to end with this. A student said to me, and this is a student who was a headache. This was a student who resisted. <laughs> she resisted every biblical course. She resisted any kind of discipline, any kind of structure. But that reflected where her life had been before she came to us, okay? And I had to go there and always go, look at her and go like this. Let her know that I was watching her because she needed to do the right things. She came to me at the end of the year. She said, Dean, I have had the best year of my life. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> she said, I have learned that I have a mind. I have learned that I should take it seriously. Mm -hmm. But the best thing, Dean, you know what it is? She said, it's the first time in my life I, had a real, I held a real live Bible in my hand. And even though I know I gave you a headache about this, I finally found out that the Bible is relevant to my life. And she said, and you know what else, Dean? And I said, oh my goodness, I can't take this. And I said, what else, Elise? <laughs> and she said, Dean, I want Jesus in my life, and I think I'm ready to go to church. Mm. Amen. Amen. Uh, following that is hard. All right, <laughs> go ahead. Um, well, uh, for me, once again, my name is Pastor Jonathan Brooks, uh, known as Pastor Jay in Chicago. And um, we take more of a grassroots 
uh, approach at my church uh, in Inglewood on the south side of Chicago. Um, I'm not only pastor, but I've been a, a teacher in the Chicago public schools uh, for the last nine years. And so um, I have firsthand experience as to um, what it is that our kids experience on a daily basis. Uh, I've worked in everything from uh, schools that were closing down at the moment to schools that were reopening because they were closed down. So I, I've seen both perspectives. Um, we have a community development arm of our church called Canaan Community Redevelopment Corporation, which has an after-school program called the Diamond Academy. Um, and, and what we found through that program was um, when we reached out to the community to find out what was necessary, uh, we just found out that the, the kids needed help with their homework. That was the number one problem. And so that's what we decided to do. Well, then let's help kids with their homework. But then, of course, more needs popped up. And, um, and so we started building relationships with those children. We started building relationships with their parents. And we found out that the school they were going to was really, really struggling um, in the neighborhood. I mean, a lot of the parents were just furious at uh, some of the things that were happening there. And so we found out, well, in order to reach the kids better and to, to help the, the parents understand that we need to be involved in what's going on at the school. Um, me being a teacher, I understood that didn't mean going in, storming in, saying, what's going on in here? Let's fix this. Um, what it meant was, let's go in and meet some of the teachers, let, let's meet the administrators, and let's build relationships with them. Um, through that opportunity, we've been able to uh, just have a nice partnership with Henderson Elementary School, and they allow us to come in, and uh, we've, we've used their gym at times to do sports uh, events with the kids. Um, of course, their kids come to our, uh, our building for the after-school programming. But also, the next arm we found out is that, um, and, and it's just one of the things that's near and dear to my heart, is that a lot of times uh, we don't realize how, um, how, how little we empower teachers. Uh, a lot of times, uh, they're the ones who just catch all the blame for everything. Um, and I'm not saying that teaching uh, is not a main factor in how our kids succeed. You know, I, I believe that. But a lot of times when teachers feel alone, when they feel desperate, when they feel like no one's on their side, when they feel like administration is coming down on their back, when they feel like uh, all the problems of the schools come down on them, uh, they rebel. And, and they don't feel comfortable uh, coming to work anymore. And so one of the things that we've decided to do as we move forward is to really celebrate the teachers at Henderson, to provide opportunities, teacher appreciation days, ask the administration which uh, teachers are really going above and beyond for the students, and to celebrate them as a church in the community that is proud of teachers who go the extra mile for our children. And... Um, as we, as we move forward with that and, and as I'm, I'm, I'm meeting the administration, the new administration at the school and learning more about it, um, you know, I'm just praying that that will be uh, the heart. As our church continues to adopt Henderson, to love on those students, love on those parents, and to now love on those teachers like we've never done before, that that will be our way of, 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 of showing a reform in that school while, while uh, um, there's, there's people speaking to the power. Uh, we want to be on the ground level making sure that um, those, those who are left are not left alone. Amen. Good morning. You can hear me? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I'm Kimberly Richardson, and um, I'm a homeschooling mom of 10 years, and um, it has been... Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> It has been a privilege to um, homeschool my children, to be uh, their teacher uh, for 10 years. And I've also had the blessing of having my husband um, share in that um, adventure. Um, a couple of years ago, um, he took a layoff package and I was offered a job. And so we figured that's the Lord saying, you, we're gonna have you guys flip-flop this thing uh, for a little while. And um, he was the main homeschooler uh, for the last two years. And um, it, it was really, it's interesting to hear my children's perspective on it because um, my <laughs> style is totally different from his style and they've gotten the blessing of, of experiencing both firsthand. And I'm the, the visionary person and not real good with uh, routines and structure and things like that. So we would homeschool in the park and, um, oh, I don't feel like following this curriculum today. Let's go hug a tree and, uh, <laughs> you know, all of that. And um, we would just have a ball. But at the same time, um, 
I, was, I wasn't sure that I was actually um, following scope and sequence, and if I had put them in school at that time, would they be behind? And, you know, I felt inadequate in that sense. Um, and then my husband comes home, and he's very structured and very much on point with routines and curriculums and things like that. And so the structure totally changed for them. Um, but my uh, daughter, I have three children, my oldest daughter, she's 14, and um, the Lord had my back because she's an amazing teenager. And all of my, and all of my inadequacy and um, discouragement and all of that, um, I was obeying God, what God told me to do. And, um, and he had my back. She's an amazing, amazing young lady. Mm. And, um, and my other two, they're coming along pretty well, too. I'm better at it now. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but it's been a wonderful journey. The thing that I did not do 10 years ago is I didn't have a, a support base. So homeschooling was fairly, it wasn't as popular as it is now. And um, so there wasn't a lot of support, not a lot of resources. And um, I did feel like I was kind of um, on my own out there on an island. And, and I questioned God all the time. Like, are you sure? Are you really sure you want me to be doing this kind of thing? And um, resisted and didn't have a good attitude about it for a long time. Um, but yet and still, he showed me all kind of signs that I was supposed to be doing that with them. And um, now, I don't want um, people who desire to do it to not have that support. There's a lot of resources now, and anyone who desires to do it, um, there's uh, people out there, there's groups, there's communities, there's support. It's, um, it's, it's really a popular thing, and even Chicago Public Schools have embraced uh, people who want to do uh, that. Um, as well, they have um, programs and curriculums for it, and they can even participate, you know, in sports and different things like that with um, the school system if they choose to. So it's a, a wonderful, viable um, option um, that God calls parents to do in, in, in a lot of situations, and um, it's it's been it's been truly uh, wonderful. And so now we do have support. Uh, God has called me to lead uh, families and teach families who want to uh, do that and um, so I've joined this organization called Classical Conversations and um, the mission for Classical Conversations is to, to know God and to make him known. So the, the model is uh, that we use a biblical worldview and classical tools um, to teach parents and equip parents and encourage students um, in their ventures to uh, homeschool their children. So we'll talk more about that. Well, God bless you. I have three kids, and it's hard enough just to get them to bed at night. Um, <laughs> wow. I am not a pastor. I'm not an educator. So I'm sometimes wondering what I'm doing on a panel with such great pastors and educators, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express, so maybe that's why <laughs> Leroy invited me to be up here. Um, my route to urban ministry and then the, the way that that's evolved into being a part of education was one via... Being a football player, um, I played football at college at the University of Florida. Are there any Gators here? All right, go Gators. There's a few. What? Oh, there's somebody else. Uh, but uh, it's probably a Seminole. There's one of those in every group. Um, but I was uh, coming out of college, I was drafted by Mike Ditka. got a chance to play for the New Orleans Saints. Mm -hmm. So I went to... Uh, to play for the Saints, and I was really hoping and praying that the, the way the Lord would use me was similar to college, where we had a lot of success and mm -hmm. could glorify God through that platform, which is always fun when everything works and you can give God glory. We like that, but often it's, it's through the tough times <laughs> that he really uh, uses us the most. Well, the first time I realized that maybe I wasn't in New Orleans just to play football, that maybe there was another route for me was in my first start. We got beat, and on the last play of the game, at least the last play for me, I was back to pass, and I was looking to my right, and the guy came off the left edge unblocked, but I didn't see him coming. And as he came, he dove, you know, just incredible leaping headfirst dive as I turned my head, and the crown of his helmet hit me in the temple right as I turned. And, of course, you know, now it'd be like a $50,000 fine. Back mm -hmm. then it was like, great hit. <laughs> so this guy hits me. <laughs> And he falls off this way, and I, and I stood back up to look, but I couldn't see anything. It was total darkness. And I remember blinking my eyes, and then I, I remember you know, thinking, man, this is scary. And then I got hit, and I was on the ground getting up, and I still 
couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. And uh, so first, you know, I thought, you know, that I was blind. And, uh, and then worse, well, what happened was when this guy hit me, and as he went this way and I spun this way, my helmet spun all the way around my head <laughs> to where the face mask was back here. <laughs> it's funny now. Um, <laughs> But like I said, I really thought at the time I was blind, and as I laid there on the ground in this darkness hearing voices, I thought maybe I had died. And then I didn't see Jesus, so I was really nervous. Um, one of my linemen after the game, the linemen always have something smart to say, he said, uh, well, if you thought you died, did you see a light or anything? Some people like see these lights, and I said, I actually did, but it was, it was moving this way. And he said, no, that was just your ear hole as it went by. Um, so I realized pretty quickly it maybe wasn't going to be being a football player. And it was at that same, almost the exact same week as that game, I got introduced and heard about a ministry called Desire Street Ministries in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans. And I remember driving in the first time and just seeing things that, that broke my heart. But one of the things that stuck with me was when, when somebody told me there on my first visit that the public school was so bad that the valedictorian hmm. usually each year couldn't pass the ACT. And, you know, since, since that time, which has been 14 years ago for me, you know, I've learned a lot and learned a lot about the theories of that and the whys and what's fair and what's not fair and, and how it happened. But my two-year-old daughter now, I think, can sum it up better than anybody. Mm -hmm. Anything goes wrong in our family with her brothers, and she'll stand up and she'll just say, no fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what she said. And mm -hmm. that summarizes that whole mm -hmm. situation. And, you know, so through the years at Desire Street as an inner city uh, community development ministry in mm -hmm. New Orleans, in that neighborhood, we, uh, we took the approach of supplementing what was happening at the public school. And certainly there's a lot of public schools where that can be a real effective model in the after school. And, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, sometimes you're just not going to get the results you need. Uh, and in that situation, we, we were led to start a private school and started mm -hmm. Desire Street Academy, which, mm -hmm. which existed for seven years. Um, we've, uh, we've taken the route of supporting charters as well. So uh, we've uh, got a charter school on a campus in Baton Rouge and are helping mm -hmm. to start a charter in New Orleans right now. Um, and then after Katrina came, um, we have relocated. We're still working in the Ninth Ward, working in the Eighth Ward, started a church there, helped start a church. And now what we do is we come alongside other inner city ministries in the Southeast mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. help them. So our, our vision is to develop 12 thriving and sustainable urban ministries in the next five years. Uh, in the southeast. Amen. Amen. So we've, we've, we've let everybody know um, what you do. Um, I'd like to dive in a little bit more um, to answer this question, why? Like, what, why did you choose this particular path? Why homeschooling? Why, why support your local public school? Why support charter schools? Why are you advocating um, down at City Hall and at your state capitol? Um, let's dive a little bit more into that, and uh, let's, we'll, we'll start with you, Elizabeth. Let's, uh... Well, there are three things that you have to think about, and those are, first of all, you have to think about spirit, and then vision, and then you have to think about partnerships. Spirit has to do with the fact that when you have a system that does not respect human dignity and is unjust in your community, you have to think beyond that system. And in order to think beyond that system, you have to throw off the spirit of that system and you have to put on the spirit of servanthood of Christ. And when you do that, that's your why. Mm. The spirit of servanthood of Christ will give you vision. It will make you to see the people that Christ sees and everybody else forgets. That systems are only looking at themselves and their self-interest, but Christ is pointing us back to persons, to the world that Christ so loves. And so we see the real needs of the students and we work around the unnecessary encumberments of the system. Mm -hmm. The why then also moves you to partnership. You have to have partnerships. Christian universities, we need you to partner with churches. We need you to partner with homeschoolers. We need you to partner with faith-based organizations. When we do that, what we've been able to do is to create transitional versus remedial education 
We've been able to create a core of adjuncts and professors who are experts in their field and professionals, and they want to study the persons and they want to see how they take that subject matter and make it real for their lives. So you have to think about people. You have to think about people. It's Christ who makes us see real people. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing. It's atrocious that we should have the school systems that we have hmm. that continue to cut. And when they cut, what are they cutting? They're cutting the necessary teachers. And that's why we have to support the teachers. And I'm so glad that you're doing that because the teachers are stuck in a system that is not looking at the children and the youth. And so that was part of the mm -hmm. why. When you love Christ, let me, let me just say this real quick. Can I have, have a couple of months? Okay. Let me just say this real quick. God is love, but it's not the kind of love that's touchy-feely. Okay? Mm. When Jesus came to this world, when you look at a quarter, you have heads on one side and tails on the other side. Right? Okay. When you look at Christ, you have mercy on one side and you have anger on the other side. Because anger is that which will confront the systems in order that the mercy of Christ may go forth to all the people. Hmm. Injustice is when you have a dam that says, mine, 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 and they take all the love for themselves and they don't let that love flow to everybody else. And when that happens, the prophetic piece there is the kind of anger that comes in and says, no, get out of the way and that wants to see the love of Christ flow to all of God's people. Mm -hmm. And that's the why. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I guess we got another preacher up here. I thought we only had two, but... <laughs> ah, okay. Kimberly, you want to give us your why? Um, mine is out of obedience to Christ. And... Um, I actually really grudgingly did it um, out of obedience to Christ. Um, so in the beginning, um, God, I was actually on a track to being like Miss Corporate America and didn't even think I would have children. Um, and, and I hate to say this, but I, didn't, I wasn't that fond of children uh, either. <laughs> and uh, so God, whoa, did he have a plan for me? And um, so he saved me, brought me to a church where I was just mine, my mind was blown because I saw women that did not work. They were um, submissive to their husbands and loved it and joyfully. And you know, when you're not saved and you're like, you know, headstrong and independent and all of that, and you hear the word submit, oh my goodness, you're like, oh no. And um, the Lord really, he just totally changed me because I'm seeing these women who, uh, I just had this image of a Christian woman submitting to her husband that she didn't look good, that she, you know, just, I don't know. But <laughs> I, and these women were fit and beautiful and joyfully submitting to their husbands. And then I heard about the homeschooling. And I'm going, Lord, why? Why'd you bring me to another planet, you know? <laughs> and um, because he had a plan for me. And so when I did get married to my awesome husband of 18 years, um, <laughs> and then and we talked about, he's like, Kim, I would like for you, you know, to homeschool and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, Lord, this is where the submission part comes in, right? So um, did it. And at the time, it was hard. It was really, really hard. Um, However, after uh, we, we did put my daughter in school for two years because I just didn't feel like I was doing a good job. And I, and I was just going through a lot of changes with it. But that's when God confirmed to me that um, I'm doing this for you, too, kind of thing. And so um, when we put her in school, it was a private Christian school. It was the best school you could have your child in as far as we were concerned in terms of biblical values. And they were so welcoming. I could go into the classroom every day and blah, 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 blah. The best scenario you could have um, if you didn't want to homeschool. And so, but I still was disconnected from my child. And when my child actually got a concept that I was trying to teach her, um, that teacher said, oh, very good. Now, I just wanted to bust with joy, that was a God sighting for me 
because um, I, I birthed that child. You know, I got to know her intimately in my womb. I saw all of her abilities. No one could appreciate when she finally got a concept more than me. And sometimes I wasn't there to, to see her get it or, or things like that. I felt disconnected. And so God really was tugging and saying, you know, that teacher can't do it better than you. Okay, you're the primary teacher. You and Glenn are the primary teachers of that child. And I gave her to you. You're, the, you're supposed to be the first educators. And so because I did feel the conviction and now I knew exactly what uh, he was calling me to do, then I joyfully embraced it. And it has been absolutely incredible. Um, homeschooling takes you to a place with your child of intimacy that you will not have with them for very long. The window of opportunity for that is very, very short. Um, it takes you to intimacy and engagement. You engage them, you talk to them, you learn their personalities. My, my uh, middle daughter, Kennedy, is the biggest comedian you ever want to meet. And I wouldn't be able to enjoy that, you know, if, if I wasn't with her every day. And why not me? You know, the, the one thing that people say is, oh, well, what about the socialization or what have you? She has a lot of friends, she's very popular, but I want to enjoy her too, you know? And I, only, I don't have a long time to be face to face with her all the time because she's gonna grow up, God's gonna use her, she'll have a family and go to college and all of those things. So my chance and my, my window to really enjoy her is now, you know? And my uh, youngest daughter is, is, is an artist. She sings like a bird, she's only eight. Um, I mean, everything, plays the piano and she never had a lesson, things like that. And, um, I'm just really, really joyful for that opportunity, and I'm learning. I feel cheated in, in my traditional education, went all the way up to get an MBA, and I still don't feel like I was well-educated. I'm becoming well-educated now because I'm learning with them, mm -hmm. and learning God's abilities, my abilities, and developing them with my children, things like that, learning how to analyze um, just wonderful scriptures and um, uh, wonderful works of reading and things of that nature. So. It's really amazing. It's really amazing. So he's called me to do it. I'm glad to do it. And so that's my answer. So, so Kimberly, I, I, I want to stick here for a minute because, uh, you know, there's, there's this, this question that's probably sitting out there, and that's, uh, black people do this? <laughs> Can you address that a little bit? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, we. Yes, that. Um, it's interesting because, um, you know, it, just one scenario this early this morning, um, my kids, we when they want to take advantage of the pool and we didn't get here early enough yesterday. So anyway, um, this one gentleman, uh, asked, you know, uh, were we here for the conference and all of that? And we told him, yeah, we're speaking about homeschooling. I mean, he's going, what are you kidding me? You know, homeschooling looking like, like didn't want to say the black thing, but I knew that's probably <laughs> what, <laughs> what he meant. And no, it is not a prevalent um, uh, situation for African American uh, communities. Um, and actually, our homeschool group, we actually, we meet one, for one school day with um, it's 30 other children and across 15 families. And um, there's only two black families in the group. And uh, it's just not something that is, I don't think it's not embraced, but it's just not known about. And now, actually, a lot of uh, people are, a lot of African Americans are learning about it. They're learning that they can do it. We have families where both parents work and they're still homeschooling. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have families where there's a single parent and they're homeschooling. So it's, 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 it's really becoming much more widespread. And the reason why is because they are starting to see the fruit. And a lot of parents have the desire to do that. A lot of parents have the desire to be that engaged and that intimate with their children, and they just don't have a way to do it. And so um, that's part of my calling, my husband and I, um, our calling, is to educate people on that you can do this, there's support, you can do it, even though God has given you other things to do, like earn an income, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we're here to support you, to teach you how to do it. So it is becoming more widespread, right. but it is, yeah, you're right. It's, Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Matthew, can you uh, uh, give us a little bit of your why and then, and then talk, talk to us about what's different about your approach? What, what's innovative about, about what you're doing? 
Sure. I, I think the why, first of all, is to fulfill uh, the Great uh, Commission, uh, to go into all the world uh, and to make disciples. Uh, that the public school system in our approach and our philosophy, it is a world system. Children live in complicated system, education, family, social systems, peers, some foster care, some juvenile justice. So the public school is this huge system of 50 million children uh, to fill the Great Commission. Uh, the research shows from Child Evangelism Fellowship, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes and others, that's what they call the four to 12 or four to 14 window. That the person is most likely to come to Christ uh, between those ages of four to 12, uh, uh, four to 14. 32% uh, probability, 4% probability between 13 and 18, and 6% probability of a, after 19. So we think it's an opportunity to expose Christian people uh, to children, to build these relationships across mm -hmm. which the gospel can be shared, mm -hmm. to fulfill the Great Commission. Secondly, to fulfill the Great Commandment, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Um, and so we want our children to have uh, higher educations. We should want that for other children as well in our community. I call the public schools the social pathological diagnostic centers. That makes me sound educated. Uh, <laughs> Smarter than me, for but, sure. But the public school is the place where we're diagnosing all these problems with children mm -hmm. uh, who come from families where they don't have the type of parental support, come from under-resourced neighborhoods, come from areas of tremendous challenge. So there we diagnose these challenges in the public school system. But from the time a child is, uh, starts school till their 19th birthday, they only spend 9% of their time at school and 91% of the time somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the school cannot do it all if there's not a community uh, supporting them. So that's a part of, of the why that we do it. I think where our approach is different is that we're looking at the school as one of the elements in a community, one of the components to build a, a healthy community using the CCDA model. It's a little bit different that we advocate for policy change through legislation to create the type of environment in the community that we need. Mm -hmm. And we have legislation that we have gotten passed, a community development pilot school legislation to allow five schools in our neighborhood to, to operate outside of the regular legislation that applies mm -hmm. to other schools. Uh, another way that it's, in, it is different is that we have a presence in the schools with our staff people. We have coined a phrase we call the, uh, what we call the instructional comprehension gap. And the uh, teachers teach at one level, Children learn at another level. That happens every day. Mm -hmm. We don't find it out until they take the achievement test. Yeah. So it's staff people in the classroom during the day actually listening to instruction and then working with the children during school and after school. We can see where that gap is occurring and then how we can uh, try to close that gap. Mm -hmm. Lastly, another way it's a little bit different, um, unlike Danny Wolf, where I didn't play for a big-time college and win a Heisman <laughs> Trophy, but um, I did bounce the basketball. <laughs> Uh, and, and I learned a lot from athletics, and I learned that in, in playing sports, that if there's a vision, if there's high expectation, if there's a process that's developed, mm -hmm. that athletes can appoint, uh, achieve at high levels. Mm -hmm. So we produce the best football players, basketball players, fastest runners, and the best boxers from low-income, under-resourced neighborhoods, and no one ever makes excuses for the children. Mm -hmm because we have a vision they will achieve at high levels athletically. Mm -hmm. We have an expectation that they will do it. We have a passion and commitment to help them do it, and then we create a system by which we help them fulfill that through major league, bitter league, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we've created a system, the in-school, after-school programs, an intense summer academic enrichment program, a networking of everybody in the community that touch our children. So we have, I have a contract with the Major League Sports programs, Major League Basketball programs, that they get their parents to sign releases so we can get the academic uh, information on every child that's in those sports programs. So we can show the coaches and the parents, this is how your children are doing athletically. And then lastly, we've tried to cast a community-wide vision. Most of the time we talk about what we want, don't, don't want children to do. We don't want them to do drugs. We don't want them to drop out of school. We don't mm -hmm. want them to be in the juvenile justice system. But we seldom cast a compelling vision of what we want them to become. Mm -hmm. So on the west side of Charleston, we've cast this vision. We have a mm -hmm. vision for our youth. Our youth, our vision is this, is that our children will pursue, pursue spiritual excellence, mm -hmm. moral excellence, intellectual excellence, academic excellence, and physical excellence. Mm -hmm. That is our vision. That they will be pursuing those things in that order and in that priority. And we, we're trying to create a single narrative in our neighborhood and in our community that we will not make any excuses for poor academic performance. Mm -hmm. Here's the last thing I say. When I walk in schools, the first thing the teachers want to tell me that 85%, 95% of our children are free to reduce lunch. You know what I say? Hallelujah. <laughs> and they look at me strange. 
I said, what that tells me is that in this school, the children will not suffer from malnutrition mm -hmm. because they're getting at least two healthy meals every single day. Mm -hmm. So how do we now make the commitment that they're going to all achieve at a much higher level? So I think what is different is we have developed a system, just like there's a system to produce high-performing athletes to produce high-performing children from our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, Pastor Brooks, you're, uh, you're a pastor of a church, and uh, your, your church has adopted this school of... Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, in our... You know, in our mindset, we're not a we're not a very large church. Um, uh, we struggle financially. We struggle <laughs> in lots of areas, actually. But um, you know, one area that our, our church is really, really strong in is is building community and 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 showing people that we truly, and genuinely care about them and love them. Um, no matter if we can't always provide the best, um, we can we can love you. Mm -hmm. And um, and so what that's led us to do. Um, kind of through this, uh, this, it just started with this after school program, which is so hilarious to me, is that we just realized that um, with or without that after school program, with or without, you know, anything can happen, that if we can build relationships with these students, we can build relationships with their parents, we can build relationships with the school, we can continuously make an impact on our neighborhood. Mm. And that was the key. Um, you know, we, we had a, a, a tragedy happen where our, our furnace went out and, and then uh, we had a pipe burst in the building and so the building was shut down and mm -hmm. we had to shut down the after school program and the kids were upset and we were upset and everything was going wrong. And what I found out though was those kids who were part of our after school program were still thriving even though the after school program had to be shut down. Why? Because the relationships have been built. Mm -hmm. I could still go to the school. Mm -hmm. I was still visiting them on their prom night. I was mm -hmm. still with them when they had a football game. I was mm -hmm. still, and because I built that relationship, what I found was is that the kids were able to be pushed forward regardless of any of the outside influences that, that, that caused us to not be able to do what mm -hmm. we think we should be doing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so um, the perfect example, I'll give you a young man named Tommy. Um, Tommy started an after school program when he was about eight years old. Um, Tommy was a thug. Tommy was a, a funny little kid, but I mean, uh, we had a basketball rim in the back of the church that the kid could come play on. Mm -hmm. Tommy said, I'm taking that to my block. And two blocks over, they were playing basketball on the rim. <laughs> so we let him have it. Okay, we'll get another one. Y'all keep playing ball over here. Um, Tommy came to church once. Um, after church, Tommy stole the drums. <laughs> was tied the shoestring around it and walked around playing it like he was in a band. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Tommy was that kid, but here we are 10 years later and Tommy is a freshman at Alabama State University. All right. And it was because, and I, and I talked to him on his prom uh, when he was going away and I said, man, how are you getting out of here? I was like, what did you do? He was like, man, y'all just told me I could do it. Hmm. Y'all just kept saying, no matter how much I messed up, I stole stuff, I was being silly, I was doing dumb stuff, and y'all just kept saying, it doesn't matter, man, you're going to be all right. Hmm. And so, yes, I admit, our public schools are failing our children. But we're failing our public schools. Hmm. You know, we, we harp about white flight from the neighborhoods. We harp about uh, people wanting to leave and, and what relocation means and all these words that we use, but we're letting our children just die. Because as, as, as Dr. Perkins was talking about this morning, all those churches in the neighborhood, there are more than enough churches to just adopt a school. And if the school is raggedy painted, hmm. you know, if the teachers are frustrated and, 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 and have high stress, Buy them a masseuse for the day. It's not much. It's just showing love, saying that we know it's tough. We know it's hard. But we want to be a part of the solution and not just keep harping that you guys are the problem. And that's just our heart, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, no, we don't have all the answers. No, um, you know, I haven't been with, with, with Pastor Watts to go lobby down, you know, in, in Washington. But you know what? I have given teachers hugs when they're on the brink of crying. Mm of quitting, of giving up. And to us, you know, just being on that level, it just, it just makes us feel like we love them and, and, and that God is in that. So. Amen. Amen.
So uh, I watched a couple football games with, with, with Danny, and uh, he's sitting there, and uh, he goes, oh, yeah, that kid right there playing for LSU, he, went, he, he, he came to Desire Street. And I'm like, what in the world? Like, huh? Tell us, tell us some of the stories, um, how you've seen uh, this work change the lives of kids in your community. Uh, first, just a word on the question why also. Mm -hmm. As we were answering that, it made me think, you know, why do any of us do what we do? And, you know, if we asked that question quickly, we all would get up here and we would have a great answer, usually praise God, and Scripture, and all these things. Mm -hmm. But I think truth be told, there's a lot of mixed reasons why we do anything we do. Mm -hmm. And so often we're so quick to, to know and be aware and share the good ones, the positive ones, the godly ones. Amen. But I think deep inside all of us as leaders, there are other factors that are driving us to emptiness, neediness, brokenness that mm -hmm. sometimes propel us. And I think part of our goal and my prayer for myself and all of us as leaders is that God would continue to reveal some of those things and heal them mm -hmm. so that they don't define and limit um, what God can do through us. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm glad I didn't answer that question fully because if I told you all the reasons why I was up here, you wouldn't <laughs> want me up here. Um, but, you know, a couple quick stories. You know, um, right now there's a, a church being planted in the Ninth Ward called Desire Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And the, the three leaders of Desire Fellowship were all three children that grew up that went to the after-school program mm -hmm. that were part of the ministry. They went off to college. Mm -hmm. They came back. And now they're, they're planting and leading mm -hmm. the church. So mm -hmm. uh, look them up, Desire Fellowship. It's a, it's a, great, a great story. Um, and, uh, you know, I was at, uh, Florida field one day watching LSU play Florida and, and LSU kicked off and the kid from Florida was so fast. They thought he was going to run it back and he got tackled inside the 20. So the entire Gainesville stadium, you could have just, the, the air came out of their wind and the whole sideline at Florida was down cause this guy got tackled, uh, inside the 20, but there was one guy on the Florida sideline that was jumping up and down crazy. And that was me. <laughs> Because the kid from LSU who tackled our own Gator was D'Angelo, yeah. who was a kid off the streets of New Orleans who, um, who knows what would have mm -hmm. happened statistically, but got a part of the after school, became a part of Desire Street Academy after Katrina became part of the boarding school and was able to graduate and, and go to LSU. And, um, you know, this, this morning, right before I came up, I got a text from one of the, the leaders of Desire Fellowship that said uh, one of the other kids that for a while was a part of Desire Street that for one reason or another didn't get a chance to be a part of the school. Um, last night he was shot and this mm. morning he died. Mm. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that, you know, whether there's an educational opportunity, it's always a matter of life or death. But as we all know, in some cases it really is. And so it's re really important to take this seriously. Amen. 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 Can, uh, Elizabeth, can you share with us a, a story uh, that has changed your community or changed some of the kids, children in your, in your community? We do a lot of charter education. The children in other schools will drop out. There's about a 67% dropout rate. Same children at the charter school there's only a 1.5% dropout rate. And then they come to, um, and it's not like they don't belong to the same homes and have the same issues and so on and so forth. And then they come out to the, to the college. But sometimes in between those things, let me just say this. In our area, we just found out last week that in our area, we have in Philadelphia the largest group of persons who are doing re-entry from prison. Hmm. That changes who are the role models and what is happening and so forth. That changes how people see themselves and see themselves in the world. That changes how people see options for themselves. And so, it's a, it's a long journey, it's a long process, as you have pointed out. 
and people make choices for themselves in that process as well. And so one of the things that happens is that in between high school and college, people do a whole lot of other things. And it's not until they have a chance to reflect on their lives that then they start looking for tools to do something different with their lives. And you have to be there the entire time, just as you were there with that young man. You have to be there the entire time so that when people are truly ready, they know that you're their touchstone. They can keep coming back. You're that touchstone. And so people will come back to Esperanza, and Esperanza means hope. And so this young man came back to us. And he had done some time. And he came back and he says, I'm on parole. They won't let me be educate, do education, the rules, right? This is why what you do is so important. We have to change the policies. Mm -hmm. And so they won't let me do education. So we went into the system and we said, if you don't let him do education, he's going to be part of your statistics of recidivism. If you let us have him at the school, we'll make sure that he goes out and he becomes a productive citizen. Hmm. And it took a whole lot of convincing, and it meant that I had to put myself on the line and some of my other staff that we were going to be there supervising. And this young man came to us. And after doing quite a few years inside, he's back, he has a sense of hope, and he's on the dean's list. Hmm. Being on the dean's list means that your GPA has to be over 3.75. And let me tell you, I strive for excellence. And so I'm tough. <laughs> to get a 3.75, that means you really have to work hard. I believe in this. Sweat. <laughs> Effort. Because it makes you be your best moral self. Without effort, you start taking shortcuts. And that's what got him to where he was. So it is about hard work because then hard work makes you have discipline. And discipline is about the structures that haven't been there before. And I understand why those structures aren't there. And it's because poverty means that you have to survive. And if you have to survive, you don't have the leisure of having a routine in your house. People don't understand how important work is. Work gives you the ability to have a routine. If you don't have a routine because you have to keep surviving and you have to keep taking the moment and seizing what's in front of you, you can't create structure. And so to be able to have structure is important. And now he has to work for something, and now he has to prove himself. But here's the problem. We keep holding the benchmark very low for people. I hold the benchmark high so you can find out who you really are. Amen. I hold the benchmark high because you're created in the image of God. I hold the benchmark high because that's how you're going to find amen. out how wonderfully created you are. Amen, amen, amen. And so this young man kept coming to me and saying, Dean, this is hard. And I said, good. <laughs> but you're made for it. You're made for it. The only reason you know it's hard is because you realize that you have to keep giving a little bit more. I said, but you haven't run out of what you have to give. And so he kept going forward and going forward and going forward. Huh. And this young man is moving on. He lost, he, he couldn't get a job because people don't care that you're trying to make it through college. They don't care that you need to leave maybe a couple of, a half hour late just to be able to make the bus to be able to get to the college from where you are. They don't care about that. And so, again, we had to work with his employer. We had to work with the professor and say, okay, he's just going to have to come in late. And we're going to have to work with him. And we're going to have to tutor him. And we're going to have to stay a little extra with him. And we do all of that, not just with him, but with all of our students because the system keeps attacking them from different sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to make, we have to create a system that doesn't also attack them, but which encourages and coaches and creates the spaces for people to be able to do what God has really created them to do. Mm 
Amen. And that's his story. Amen. Well, we hope uh, that you are able to uh, pick up something from these incredible, incredible examples of, of how a little bit of leaven in the kingdom can change a life, you know, uh, in the systems that are part uh, of, of our country. Also, I hope what you picked up is that they uh, are appreciative of one another, uh, that they are not uh, fighting one another to say, my way is better, my way is better, your way is bad. They are, as a community, working in different areas, supporting one another's work. And we pray that you walk away um, with that as well. Pastor Brooks is going to uh, have our final word and close us with prayer. And um, uh, for the record, a brother's leading this panel and there's five minutes left to spare. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And then he asked the pastor to pray. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> leave, us, leave us some time on that I clock. I got you. I got you. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much. Uh, first of all, for the awesome privilege it is uh, to be working for you. The awesome privilege it is to be involved uh, in this world that you've created. To be a small piece of leaven in the kingdom. To know that in every corner and every neighborhood and every city and every state, God, that there's a remnant of people, the people of God who are concerned about people created in your image. God, we thank you for every single person on this stage and for every single person who's, who, who's working hard to innovate and to create opportunities in education. We thank you for the various views, the various options, the various struggles, the various triumphs, the stories of joy, the stories of, of hurt and pain. We thank you for them all because they all show us and give us a glimpse of who you are. And we pray, God, that from this point forward that we will recognize that we need each other. We need to hold each other up to support each other as we go our various uh, uh, directions to provide the best options for renovating and innovating the educational systems in our country. God, we pray that we can come back to being leaders, not just leaders here, but leaders in the free world and education, that our children can become uh, uh, the leaders of tomorrow and be adequately ed educated for the task at hand. And that they would know that those of us who've gone before them have given our lives for that task. And lastly, God, we ask for your anointing. For your supernatural power to empower us to be agents of change. That we would trust in the power of your Holy Spirit. And that we would believe that change is on the horizon because our God is doing a new thing. We love you, God. We trust you. And we believe because you're able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or even think. And you're doing it according to the power that's working in each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank our panel. <laughs>